So thank you for having us. Um, so the topic today is going to be about maintaining independence in the home. And um, so Steve kind of gave me some things that he wanted me to touch on. Um, but honestly, I could do a multiple hour presentation on all those things. So um, just know that I am going to kind of zip through some of my uh, slides because they're mainly pictures and stuff. But um, feel free to uh, ask questions and I can go back and do more detail if we need to. So just a little intro about myself. So my name is Antoinette Verdone and um, I'm the founder of Improvability. My background is in engineering. So my undergraduate degree is in mechanical engineering. And then I went to graduate school for biomedical engineering, focusing on rehab engineering. <clears throat> I've been in the industry for 20 years. I can't believe I'm saying that, but it is true. My first job, I worked for the Mississippi State Department of Vocational Rehab. Then I worked for the ALS Association in New York City for five and a half years. And then I moved to Austin in 2011, where I started my private practice. Uh, I love, I'm an art lover, uh, but don't give me a plant because I will kill it. Uh, and I've been saying this for 20 plus years. If you can think it, it's out there. And that literally becomes more and more true every day. So, um, you know, the possibilities of assistive technology only grow as time goes on. So here's our team um, and you can see the, the information and all the contact information for everyone on our website. Um, so uh, we're all based in Austin with the exception of Lena. She is uh, our Houston rep that just started in March. So it's been a, uh, Lena and Joanna both started in March. So it's been an interesting uh, ride for them. Um, so just to you know, put some faces to the names, if you talk to anyone here, you can kind of see who you're talking to. And just a little bit about improvability. Uh, what really makes us special is we really try to stay on the cutting slash bleeding edge of technology. We really try to take a practical approach. You know, we're not just about throwing equipment at someone and hoping something sticks. We really want to put together a solution that works. And we will implement what we recommend. So we will make it work if it's something we haven't done before. And we're not scared to combine products from multiple manufacturers. So, um, you know, I can think that happens a lot with mounting. You know, I kind of like this one company's tray versus this other company's arm and we'll put them together and make it work. And we feel like our job is to be an ongoing resource for our clients. So once we, once kind of you're in the improvability family, we won't let you go. <laughs> um, so, you know, I have clients say, is it okay if I call you? You know, yes, you can call us, text us, email us. You know, we're always available because literally things change every day. So we may have set someone up with certain equipment, you know, a month ago and that is out of date now. And, you know, maybe there's something that came up that would solve a problem that they're having. So we're, we want to be that ongoing resource for our clients and any per assistive technology professionals. We are a full service AT company. I'm not going to read through this list, but pretty much if it's stuff or strategies for people with disabilities, we can find a solution for that. Um, I do want to highlight that we are the smart box partner for Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. They are a um, communication device manufacturer. Um, so if you have any needs in the assistive technology realm, if we can't solve it, we'll connect you with someone who can. And something else I'd just like to mention on all of my presentations is if you are either a client or a professional working uh, or looking for assistive technology solutions for yourself or for your clients, um, there is a certification that a professional can get called the ATP. That stands for Assistive Technology Professional. There are some requirements to do that, but um, my opinion is if someone's making assistive technology recommendations, I would want to know that they have this certification. So right now on our staff, um, I have the ATP. Lena's, uh, Lena had let hers lapse because of her previous position, but she's gonna have her ATP and um, my other two field reps will be having their ATPs by the end of this year. So um, we feel very strongly that it just shows that we're part of an industry. Um, so that's just something I wanna make people aware of if you're calling companies and trying to find uh, some recommendations, that would be a question to ask. <clears throat> so today, what we're gonna talk about, I kind of split this up into three segments. One is just about um, basic home access, and then we're gonna talk about emergency preparedness and environmental controls. Again, each one of those topics could be 
a multiple hour presentation. So I'm really just focusing on the highlights so that we can kind of have this broad spectrum of information that, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. So um, I'm sure most of y'all are familiar with Steve Gleason. I really love this quote that he has, um, you know, most of what ALS takes away, technology can give back. And I would call that a cure. So, you know, as we know, there's no cure for ALS, but assistive technology really is the tool that will help give you back some of the independence that ALS takes away. So when we um, talk about um, basic home access, um, I think I know what I have encountered with a, particularly with the ALS population is people, you know, once they, you know, once they get diagnosed, they kind of go through that initial stage. But then the first thing I think a lot of people think is, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to totally tear up my house and make it accessible. That is not necessarily the case. Um, there's some pros and cons, and I'm not saying that you should never do remodeling to your house, but <laughs> I know I have some things I want to do to my house that I am, I keep kicking the can down the road because I don't want to have my house torn up. Forget it if you have, you know, you're dealing with ALS and you're dealing with all the other things to then have a contractor in your house for God only knows how long. That's definitely a daunting thing. So what I'm going to focus on is ways to give someone access to the house that would not require a major remodel. Now, I'm, I have a slide about this, but if that's something that you want to do, maybe, you know, for whatever reason, it, it makes sense in your situation, we're happy to help with that process. Um, the main thing that we can help with is helping you get apples to apples quotes from contractors. So I'll talk a little bit about that later, just as another pass by kind of topic. But um, what I'm really going to focus on is things you could do that doesn't require tearing up your house. So when we kind of take structural modifications off the table, the two things that we really need to focus on is getting in and out the house, bathroom access in two regards, one for bathing slash showering and toileting. So those are kind of our three things that we really need to, th those would be the things that we need to address. If we can address those things, then we can live life. So again, I'm gonna go through these really quick. Um, I took a lot of these slides from a presentation that I've done for professionals on how to do these, do an assessment that doesn't, for, for non-structural modifications. Um, but these are good things just to, again, don't feel like you have to remember all this stuff. It's really just kind of rules of thumb and things to um, keep in the back of your mind. So if you're looking at your house and you're like, okay, I, want, I need a ramp. How long does my ramp need to be? When you're looking at an entry door, um, the measurement you need to know is what is the height to be accommodated. So like in this example, a lot of times I've seen clients where, you know, when I ask them and then I have them send me pictures and they are only measuring the landing. They're not including that threshold. So in this particular example, this threshold is a good five, maybe six inches. So when we're talking about the height to be accommodated, you really need to make sure you're going from the floor level of the house all the way to the ground. Also being aware of the grade. So this picture doesn't show that, but if you were to turn around from your front door and look at the grade of the ground, um, I know we actually had this issue um, in Austin that some uh, developments are very hilly. So it may be that your house is up on a hill. So you could put in a 5,000 foot ramp and you're never actually gonna hit the ground. Um, or the other way around, if you um, have a grade where the ground slopes up away from the house, that will affect how long your ramp has to be. The rule of thumb is one foot for every inch. You can go shorter than that, particularly if someone's using a power wheelchair, you can cheat that a little bit one way or the other, but that's a good rule of thumb to go by. Um, so for doorways, the eight, so let me just take a side step here. The ADA is a guideline that exists and people will use that terminology a lot. You know, it needs to be accessible. It needs to be ADA compliant. What is ADA compliance? ADA compliance says that whatever has been built is accessible, is the minimum that is required by a business to be accessible to the public. So in general, it's a very low standard, but it is a standard, so it's a good place to start. But I would say in general, for most things, in someone's home, you actually need more.
than what the ADA requires. So that's just something to keep in mind that the ADA is a minimum standard. Now this is, I'm saying that actually doorways is something where we can fudge it the other way. So the ADA, which is a, you know, that's a standard we're gonna look at to start off with, the ADA requires a minimum of 32 inches of clear width through a doorway. So if you look at this picture, when you're measuring the doorway, when you open the door to 90 degrees, the door itself actually takes up some of that space. So the clear width is how much space does someone actually have to get through the doorway. So the ADA says that you need to have 32 inches. In a private home, I start to get nervous if that number's less than 30. Now, you know, it depends on where you are in your ALS journey. If someone already has a, the wheelchair that they're going to be using, they know the doorways are a problem. But if you are ambulatory, you're just kind of maybe doing a quick assessment of your house. If you have a clear width of less than 30, that's where you're going to be, want to be concerned. So in general, in private homes, the best solution would be wherever you can put a 36 inch door, that's going to solve that problem. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. <clears throat> uh, for thresholds, you know, anything over a half an inch should be ramped. And I think sometimes people think that that is, um, that, oh, it's just a half an inch. Um, but actually, inside the house, even with the power wheelchair, when you're going slow, your power wheels can actually get caught up on something even as low as a half an inch. So uh, particularly with power wheelchairs, you really want to make things as level as possible. And measuring thresholds, you really literally need to get on the floor and get eye level with that threshold. Because if, if I'm standing up and holding a tape measure, that could be the difference between an inch or two either way. So you really need to get level with uh, what you're measuring to get an accurate measurement. So here's some solutions. So um, there are modular metal ramps. This is an example of one. Um, in this case, you can see that they did have to put a small platform by the door to make it level. But in general, these can be installed very quickly. Um, they're removable. They're not attached to the structure in any way. And they are kind of an erector set. There are companies also that will rent ramps. Um, so uh, a modular metal ramp is a really good solution for a lot of people. Um, so my rule of thumb is if the height to be accommodated is over 30 inches, then we start to maybe think a ramp may not be the best solution. Now, again, there's a lot of depends here, but that's just kind of my rule of thumb. Once we go over 30 inches, then I start thinking lift. So here's an example. Um, the reason this is a client that we actually worked with, um, she didn't have ALS, she had a different disability, but, um, if I remember correctly, I want to say the height to be accommodated, it was right, it was maybe like 25 inches, but actually in her case, this was in the garage. So we didn't have space to put um, the length of ramp that she required. So this is her before. So she was marginally ambulatory. So a friend had built this ramp just to help her out. You know, mainly it was for the armrest because the ramp wasn't really accommodating that much height. So what we did is we put in a lift or some people would call it an elevator. It's kind of a stripped down elevator. And you can see we made a, a wooden platform to make a level entrance to the ramp, uh, to the lift, and then the lift goes straight up and down. So obviously this takes up a lot less space than a ramp. I mean, we could not fit the size ramp that we would need. And even if we tried to, it would, it would take up our whole garage plus. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to throw this out there because um, if you were to purchase a modular ramp versus a lift, 30 inches is about the break even point where the cost starts to, it actually can become cheaper to do a lift. So just throwing that out there. Um, another alternative, uh, this is a, a product uh, and there, there's a couple other companies that make similar products. It's a stair climber. This version is only for manual wheelchairs. They do make a version for power chairs, but I don't know that it would work in any residential setting. It would be a very unusual setting that it would work for. But actually, literally this morning I was looking for pictures and I found used ones on eBay for a couple thousand dollars. So I think new, they're probably more in the five to $7,000 range, um, but it is an option. And I, I have had clients that this is what they use to get in and out their house. 
For thresholds, one of our real go-tos for uh, anything less than four inches is a rubber threshold ramp. There's a number of reasons for that. One is that the rubber threshold ramps are very stable, even the really small ones. Uh, if you use a metal threshold ramp, they only touch the ground at the, at the um, threshold and then where they end. So especially with a power chair, someone keeps going on and off of it. It shifts a lot with use. These rubber ramps stay put even they have rubber ramps as small as a half an inch and they stay now you can um, put silicone down if you want to but for sure over a half an inch they really don't move um, and once you get past like an inch and a half two inches they're not going anywhere and they're they're super stable so it's, it, for um, the other people in the family it's not going to be a tripping hazard uh, where those metal ramps can be and you can see here these rubber ramps can be notched so that they can fit directly into the threshold. So they just have a lot of um, benefits that we really like. So here's some other examples. Uh, the picture on the right is a situation, pretend like that uh, freezer isn't there, that was getting moved. But he didn't have quite enough landing there to make a good turn. So we used these, uh, I call them, they're like Lego blocks, um, but they're made to be to take the weight of a power wheelchair or a person. So we, we just made his landing a little bit bigger there so he could make the turn and then he had that nice stable rubber ramp to, um, to access the garage. Swing away hinges, so say you measure your doorways and say you have a 30 inch door but you only have maybe 29 and a half inches and depending on you know, your size of the wheelchair, you know, getting that inch and a half back it doesn't sound like a lot, but it can really, if you have to make a tight turn after the door, it can really make a huge difference. Because um, widening a doorway is actually not a small job. I mean, we've, we've done them through our company, and I've had to contract that out with other companies, and you could spend anywhere, anywhere from $800 to $1,500 just to widen a doorway. So it's actually a pretty big job. Um, these offset hinges are giving you back the width of the door. So I know it's really hard to see if you've never seen these before. And it's even hard to take pictures. So this is what the hinge looks like, the picture on the left, and then the picture on the right is showing it actually installed on a door. This is what they look like on a door. So basically, if you see where the hinge is, it's moving the hinge from where the door and the jam come together to basically the where the trim is. So um, you do have to make sure that you have wall behind the door because the door is now going to stick out farther um, but again that inch and a half can make all the difference and you can buy these hinges online in like for like 30 bucks so they're and it's a handyman job versus widening a doorway which is not a handyman job so now we're going to transition over to the bathroom so that was getting in and out the house um, so with the bathroom, just some critical measurements. Again, if, if you are still very functional and you just want to kind of get an idea of what things might be a problem, you want to look at the threshold of your bathroom. So some bathrooms I've seen where maybe they tiled the bathroom, but the uh, rest of the house is hardwood or carpet. There could be a good, you know, half an inch, inch difference in the threshold there. So, so um, that's something to take a look at. Uh, with your tub, now the picture that I have here is actually more of like a clawfoot tub. Those have a very high side, so that's something to be aware of. Um, tub doors, so if your tub has uh, sliding glass doors, uh, typically those would eventually need to get removed. Um, how high is the tub edge? I've seen in some of these newer homes, the tub edges are very low, actually. Um, they're almost like a glorified shower and not really a tub. Um, so again, these are just some measurements you want to kind of just be familiar with and have an idea of. For a shower stall, again, um, looking at the threshold of the shower inside and out. So um, again, I've seen many different arrangements. Um, some that make it easier, some that make it harder. Uh, the size of the stall, so like in this example, there's a built-in seat. So when you're thinking, when you're looking at what the size of the stall is, you can't really count that seat. You know, it's just how much space do you have on the floor to 
get in and out of and to maneuver in. So, you know, the picture that I have here is a very small shower. And then doors, um, typically the doors would need to get removed in order to provide any sort of access. Um, grab bars, there, you can have grab bars installed and that is a relatively uh, straightforward process. You know, most handymen can handle that. The thing with, a, if you're installing grab bars into the wall, one of the sides has to be in a stud. Um, and depending on what kind of, if you have tile or if it's a fiberglass surround, that could be a challenge to do. Suction cup grab bars do exist. Something to be aware of them. And, and you can, these are from a particular company that they're a little bit beefier and fancier, but you can find them actually very inexpensive. The reason I picked this picture is that if you, you can see how this one of the edges of the grab bar is, one well, of the ends of the grab bar is on a tile. What I've been told is that these grab bars will actually pull the tile out. Uh, so you're kind of at the mercy of your tile job. So I wouldn't really recommend putting them on tile. If you do, they can't go across a grout line, but um, on a fiberglass surround, you know, they will suction very well. Um, so just be aware of that if you are suctioning them onto a tile that if there's any sort of, um, you know, if your tiles are loose or some water gets behind there and the tile job isn't 100% correct, you could actually pull the tile out. Another uh, solution for grab bars that we really like is called the Super Pole. And it comes in a couple different configurations. Um, and the nice thing about it is that you're not stuck where the studs are in the house. So it's a pole that is tension between the floor and the ceiling. And it uh, will really give you a lot of flexibility. We use these actually a lot in the bedroom because um, when you're trying to get in and out of bed, there's really nothing firm to grab onto. So the, uh, the super pole is a really great option for that. Uh, we recommend handheld showers a lot, uh, kind of something just to, if you're gonna purchase a handheld shower is get one that has on off water on the handset. They're not expensive. You just have to look for that. Um, I'm sure most of y'all are familiar with shower seats. So I'm going to skip through some of these. A tub transfer bench can be a nice uh, option uh, if stepping over the edge of the tub becomes a problem. So this lets you sit down first and then scoot over. There are some tub transfer benches that have sliding seats. So again, a lot of these just, some of these products depend on just the arrangement of your bathroom. So here's an example of a client that we worked with that um, we were removing the shower door, it was still on there, but we ended up taking it off. We put up a heavyweight shower curtain so that the water would stay in the shower. And then um, he was using a sliding tub bench to get in there. And then you can see a super pole here for um, sitting down onto the shower seat. And then also uh, you can see kind of the bottom of one that was by the toilet to give him help there. And the nice thing about the super poles is that they could be moved. So if you need them in the bathroom now and want to use them in the bedroom later, you can do that. So, you know, people will say, well, I have to do, remodel my house because I have to have a roll. I, I'm, how do I deal with the, of putting in a rolling shower? So here's an example. Um, this, I don't remember the measurements exactly, but I know the outside threshold of the shower was two inches and the inside was like five inches. So this is a little bit of an unusual situation because most showers have a higher than two inch lip on the outside, just saying. But they sent me these pictures and they're like, you know, is there anything we can do? So this was actually a perfect situation to use this product. So there's those Lego blocks again. You can actually use them to fill in the shower and that makes the shower level. And because this particular shower only had two inches on the outside, we put a rubber threshold ramp and it, it didn't take up the whole bathroom. So this was a really great solution. I don't remember the cost off the top of my head, um, but I will tell you this, uh, because the shower was square and it was me and I had hired a handyman to um, help me with the install. We were done with this, with this modification in less than two hours. So very quick. Uh, again, the shower was particularly set up to be very quick to do that. Some other options is uh, sliding benches. 
So this is, there's a couple different companies that make them. So I have a couple different pictures. They have different arrangements, whether you're sliding back or sliding forward. Again, I'm going to skip through some of this. Uh, you can see even in a very small bathroom, these will still work. And um, one thing I like about this particular one is that once you're slid over, uh, you can remove that bridge and you can close the shower curtain to help keep the water in. Antoinette, we have a question real quick yeah. from Alberto. Um, he asked, do I need to use a stud if I have three quarter, I think it's three quarter inch plywood under the tile? Um, no, you, so if you have plywood behind the tile, you should be fine. You should be able to put in a, a grab bar and uh, screw to that. I would still use anchors just to make sure that it's double, double secure. And then after you Maybe if you could get one side into a stud, but yeah, if you have three quarter inch plywood, you should be fine, um, assuming everything's sturdy and uh, you know, there's no rotting or anything. Uh, something I want to mention, uh, we have this in our office, but it actually, I, this was a product, a, a demo product that we had. We've officially donated to the ALS Association. So this is a PVC uh, slider system that is available. So if anyone out there thinks that this could potentially be useful to them, it is part of the ALS loan closet. Um, you can just email me and uh, submit, send me some pictures of your bathroom and with pictures I can be able to tell if it's gonna work or not. Um, so this is available for anyone uh, that could potentially uh, use uh, equipment from the loan closet. <clears throat> uh, when we're talking about the toilet, you're looking at the height of the toilet. Uh, a standard toilet is 14 to 15 inches, uh, ADA height toilet, there, there are ranges. So people say, oh, I have an ADA toilet. There's actually different size ADA toilets. Um, so again, depending on your height, 14, you know, if you're a shorter person, 14 to 15 inches might be fine. But if you're a taller person, just those couple more inches can make getting on up the toilet uh, a lot easier. Uh, a couple ways to address this uh, is I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, putting a topper on the toilet seat. My recommendation is that you do not use the ones that have armrests on them just because the only thing holding that device onto the toilet is a clip in the front. So if you put your weight on those armrests unevenly, it could come down. So um, I would not recommend using that particular style. Um, one option or another idea is you can raise the toilet from the floor. So there's a device called a Toilevator, that's the name of the product, and it goes between the floor and the toilet so that way you're sitting on the standard toilet seat. Um, one reason you may choose to do this uh, is if you use a bidet, uh, you need to sit on the actual toilet seat so this would give you um, a way to raise it up. Um, I have had some clients, you know, if they're on the tall side, and if they are marginal with their ability to get up from a seated position, we have put extended high toilet seats and a toilet elevator. Once they're sitting on the toilet, their feet may not touch the ground, but if it, it could be the difference between being independent with uh, using the toilet or not. One thing that I ask a lot is sometimes the height of the toilet seat is fine. It's just that someone needs help getting on and off the toilet. So a toilet seat safety frame is 30 bucks on Amazon, and it's a very simple installation. If you are not scared to take off a toilet seat and put a toilet seat back on, you can get this installed in 10 minutes, and it basically adds armrest to your toilet. So for a lot of people, that's really all they need. Uh, a bidet. So this is one of those things that um, I know I bring up just because I'm me, but uh, it's one of those things that um, can really increase independence. So, um, you know, most of us, if we had the option, we would prefer to take care of our hygiene activities independently. Um, there are very simple bidets. Uh, the picture on the left is like 30 bucks. Now, I will say with the coronavirus, there's been a run on bidets. So, um, they're not, you may have to wait a little bit then, you know, before you could get a bidet in a day from Amazon, but you might have to wait a minute because uh, a lot of people got on that bandwagon when toilet paper got scarce. Um, so the $30 ones, they're, they're, it is a very simple handy uh, homeowner DIY installation. The only thing with the standard bidet is that it does, the controls are still attached to the toilet. So if 
you aren't able to reach those controls. If you look at the picture on the right, there are bidets, as far as I know, all of these, you are replacing your toilet seat with a toilet seat that has the workings of the bidet in it. And they have ones that have wireless remotes. This one's showing it mounted on the wall, but there's no wire. So there's, I have, we have had, I can think of two clients off the top of my head that we have actually um, placed the control on the floor and they can use their feet to operate the controls. Uh, or you, it, they can be placed in your lap wherever it's easier for you to hit those buttons. And these used to be very expensive, like $900, $1,000. But you can now find these online, you know, for, don't quote me on the price, but you know, under $500, you can find these now. Um, and they have different, so you, know, you can look at the buttons to see what buttons you think might be easier or harder for you to hit. Uh, and if you need some help with that, just let us know. But uh, the bidet is definitely one of those things that once someone gets them, they kind of wonder why they waited so long. <laughs> now, there are homes that none of these solutions are going to work for. You know, these are kind of some generic ideas and things that you can look at. So something, or maybe it works sometimes, but even using these products, it's still an ordeal. So I'm throwing these out as options. Um, so there is a device called the Easy Bathe, Bathe, which is basically an inflatable pool that can go on your bed. So it's deflated, you put it underneath the user, and then you inflate the bed around them, and it has a pump to pump the water and, or actually, I'm not sure if it has a pump to pump the water, but it has a drain hose to drain the water. Um, so basically you can create a bath in the bed. Um, I've personally never known anyone to use that, but that product does exist. Um, but the Easy Shampoo is a great option because sometimes, especially us ladies, you know, if we could just get our hair washed, you know, we'd be happy. Maybe we don't need to take a shower every day. We could just have our hair washed and that can, um, Put some space between the days that we feel like we need to take a full-on bath. So this that is a very inexpensive solution. You know, very quickly and easily you could um, get someone's hair washed. There are portable shower systems. Uh, the faucet uh, is one of them uh, and it does work. So again, I can answer some more questions about that later. So with all these things that we've talked about, when we take the option of structural modifications off the table, there is a trade-off. So in general, the trade-off is that the user is not going to be able to operate these things independently. So for example, the slider systems, they all have um, small wheels where someone cannot propel themselves in that by themselves. So that is a trade-off. Typically, um, for most of the people that I encountered that were looking at these solutions for, they would need assistance in the bathroom anyway. So that may not be as big of a deal, but I just want to, you know, kind of make, uh, put that out there. Um, most of the things we've talked about, you know, the tub sliders, they're not cheap items, you know, they're thousands of dollars items, but that's still less expensive than doing a remodel to your bathroom. And even if you do remodel your bathroom, you still need a shower chair. Uh, so in general, most of those options are actually less expensive than the structural changes, but some are actually more. So the example is the Toilevator. I believe that product is around $100. Uh, if you shop, if you're a savvy shopper, you could probably find a higher height toilet for about the same price and the cost to install it would be about the same. So there are some options that are actually more expensive than alternatives. When it comes to funding these kinds of things, there really aren't good funding sources for these kinds of things. And well, just for home modifications in general, because medical insurance does not take these uh, criteria in for um, justification. Uh, some of the more basic items are expensive, you know, swing away hinges, grab, you know, standard grab bars, those are pretty inexpensive. Uh, most of the products highlight here, highlighted here would not be covered by medical insurance because they really don't fit into any category. They're not home modifications, which there's very little funding for anyway, and they're really not what most medical insurances would consider uh, an item under medical need. So funding is a bit of an issue. Uh, but like I said, you know, if you're comparing it to structural changes, it's, it can be less expensive. 
And then I just want to mention again, if you are looking to do structural changes at the house, we can do plans for the contractors and give some guidelines. Uh, so if anyone's interested in that, we'd be happy to talk to them. So now I'm going to, so let me just take a breath. And does anyone have any questions specifically about home access before we jump into emergency preparedness? And if you have any questions now or during the next section of this, please feel free to type them in the chat box. I'm just going to type something in here. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Diana. Diana says, excellent presentation and topic. Just what we need to know now. Thank you. Good. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad to be of service. So emergency preparedness, again, I could talk on this for hours and hours, but I'm just going to hit the highlights here. Um, so I'm a very big believer that everyone in the house needs to be able to call 911 24 seven. Every time I say that, the response I get is, but there's always someone there with the person with ALS. That does not negate the person with ALS's need to call 911. So I can remember it was, a, I'm saying a couple years ago, it was a number of years ago, I was actually doing um, the support group in Austin. And it was a cold rainy day so we actually didn't have that great of a turnout but if i had to guess there was maybe 10 families represented and i was specifically talking on this topic and out of the you know 10 families represented two had had a situation where the person with als need to call 911 for their caregiver so everyone in the house needs to be able to call 911 all the time uh, you can contact whoever administers 911 in your area and uh, put a note on your address that there's someone at the home that needs extra help. Some cities even give you a sticker to put on your bedroom window. Um, something new that has recently happened is uh, where you can text 911. That is not nationwide, so I have the link here, or you can just Google texting 911 and see if that's available in your area. Um, it's really been a... Um, a concern for people with hearing impairments, uh, but obviously for our for the ALS population, for people who can't use the telephone, uh, who can't speak over the phone, texting nine one one would be a benefit. Uh, yes, so, you know, yeah. Oh, sorry, we have a couple of questions. As maybe yeah, yeah. as soon as you're done with this section. Okay. Yeah. Let me just uh, do this one slide, and then we. Uh, Wonderful. Get Thank you. Uh, so. For helping contact 911, again, there's many options out there. Um, one solution that could work for a lot of people is just to put your cell phone on a lanyard. So if it slips out your hands, it doesn't fall on the floor. Uh, some of the smartwatches have some fall detection features in them. So if someone were to take a spill, it would automatically call certain people. Um, I know the Apple Watch has, if you press, if you set it up, you can press the button on the watch and um, it'll send SOS signal. And there are some emergency response devices. So I won't go into details with that. Um, emergency egress. Uh, in your house, you want to make sure you have the appropriate smoke detectors. Um, I think most fire departments, if you just show up there and say, what do I need? They'll tell you. Um, a lot of times I'll have people say, well, I need a, I need a door out of my bedroom. You might need that. But when we're talking emergency egress, the goal is to get your body away from the building. So that could be accomplished by just having a low window that you could either by yourself or with some help get your body out. And I mean, literally, if you're just log, log rolling in the grass just to get away from the building, that's, you know, when we're thinking emergency, that's what we're thinking about. Um, and then getting attention inside the home, a simple wireless doorbell can solve that problem. If you can't push the button, um, we make a switch adapted doorbell that will allow someone to get, a, uh, to make uh, their needs known inside the house. Okay, so what are our questions? Okay, we've got a few questions here. Um, some really great questions. Um, Alberto asks, are any of these items tax deductible? I'm not a tax person, but um, I do know, I know enough because I, you know, people ask this question, but, you know, tech, check with your tax person also because I know, especially in the last couple of years, a lot of deductions that existed have changed because of increasing the um, standard deduction and all that. But I do believe um, there is, there used to be, last time I looked, a tax deduction specifically for accessibility. So if you Google accessibility and taxes, um, 
I think it's kind of like your medical ex uh, exemptions where you will have to have spent a certain amount to be able to take it. So definitely talk to your tax person because you may be able to get some taxes off of that. Great. Um, Austin asked, um, would you mind touching on mobile ramps to get into other facilities other than your own home? Okay. So yeah, um, there are portable ramps um, that fold in half. They, if they get longer, you can even fold them in half and in half again. Really anything more than six feet, you're not carrying with you. Um, so if you were gonna purchase one, I would say you'd wanna stick with maybe a four foot to six foot ramp. Even that is, it's, those metal ramps do get heavy uh, and that's really only gonna get you up one, maybe two steps. So, um, and that's with a manual chair. If you have a power chair, you know, you really need uh, at someone else's home, you know, you may be limited to where you can get around, but yeah. Um, and you can find those online actually. Uh, Amazon sells them for uh, really good prices, you know, a couple hundred bucks. And uh, if you fold it in half, you can throw it in your van and you can have it with you to at least get up one step. Great. Um, Dutch asks, with ALS, I can see needs changing over time. Can we use your services as our needs change? Definitely. Um, when I worked for the ALS Association, especially when I was called in for home access questions, I would really say, let's make a plan for the worst case scenario. So if you were 100% dependent for your bathing and getting in and out the house, let's come up with that plan. And I would write it out and you could just literally stick it in a drawer. And when the time came, you could pull it out and take a look at it. So because even though they're um, simple and maybe not as expensive as doing structural, they're still investments. So I say, let's kind of think it through, come up with a plan, and then you can implement that plan as you need it. But yeah, for sure, a lot of these things really, depending on where your functional level is, um, that's where you're gonna go. Also, a big help in that area is the loan closet. So before you buy anything, call your local ALS representative and see what's in the loan closet because uh, you're, you won't be the first person asking for that item and chances are they're going to have it in the loan closet and you can use it for the time that it's useful to you and then you can pass it on to the next person. Thank you for that. Um, Austin has asked, are these emergency alarms able to connect wireless, wirelessly to their AAC device? My father has written off most of his medical equipment and that's how we labeled it. Okay, so he was- oh, two separate right. thoughts there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the short answer is yes. Um, again, I don't wanna to go too much into detail, so I'm happy to you know, uh, address personal questions uh, outside of this meeting, but um, when we set up uh, our communication devices, we can have it where this item that's on the screen right now, that can be activated directly through the communication device. That is technically possible. If you're talking about the emergency response systems, it really depends. I would say with, once you get to, if someone's using a C device, probably the simplest solution would be to connect their cell phone to the communication device. And that way they can make phone calls directly through that. As far as I'm aware, all AAC devices have the ability to do that, um, the ones that we sell do. Um, so whether they're texting a friend or they can call, I know we use the device that we use, we can even have a button where they hit one button and it can send a pre-made text to people. So it can be, you know, I need help, please call me. Uh, so we can do a lot of fancy stuff when we get to the AAC devices. And then Jan says, thank you so much for your help. You're welcome. That's all the questions I have right now. So now we're gonna talk about environmental controls. Um, so environmental controls is a, a term that we use for controlling anything that would be in your environment as far as what we're typically referring to as light switches, uh, light bulbs, television, that kind of stuff. And I will tell you over the last few years, things have totally changed. Um, the Amazon Alexa has really revolutionized this whole area uh, and has made it cheaper and just more user-friendly. So again, 
I could go on and on for days on this topic, but I just want to give you all some highlights. So kind of if you've never even thought about this, it might kind of give you some ideas. Um, as a disclaimer, this is a very quickly changing world. So it's really frustrating as a presenter because it doesn't let me use my old presentations because even six months ago, I can go through a presentation I did six months ago and half of that stuff is out of date. So um, it is what it is, that's technology. And with consumer equipment, things can change without warning. So back in the day when devices were being made, environmental control devices were being made specifically for people with disabilities, they didn't change. They were expensive and they were very, 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 very difficult to set up. But once you bought it, it's gonna work forever until, you know, until the things that it was connected to didn't work anymore. But with consumer equipment, we are in control. So Amazon's in control, Google's in control of when that equipment's going to work or not. So I'm just saying that. I'm skipping the slide because it doesn't really matter. Um, so something, so I'm sure most of y'all are familiar with the Amazon Echo devices. Uh, the device itself has some functionality. You can ask it the weather, you can access the time, you can uh, call people, I'll get into that in a minute. You can make lists, you can listen to music. You can, apparently, I never use it for this, but apparently people use it for timers a lot. So just, if all you did was bought an Echo Dot, which they go on sale, you can get them for under 50 bucks. Uh, if you got like the one, you can probably find generation old ones on eBay for, you know, 20, 30 bucks. It actually has functionality that you can do that would be fun. Where we really get into the fancy stuff is adding the skills. So skills are like apps for Alexa. Now I'm focusing on Alexa because that's the system that we use. Most of this capability is available with Google Home, but again, I'm just picking the one that we work with the most. And in general, Alexa, the Amazon ecosystem, I feel is a little bit more geared towards home automation. Uh, so there's these skills and they have skills for all kinds of things. And then once they're synced, you can use those to do uh, different things. Uh, okay, so some of this is a little too detailed. Um, so there's a whole range of Echo devices. Um, if you get an Amazon Echo Plus or the Echo Show, the 10 inch Echo Show, those actually have a Zigbee hub in them. And that would allow you to actually connect to more things than if you got ones that didn't have the Zigbee hub. So I'm just gonna throw that out there. Um, the calling features of Alexa is very useful. Um, and I know we're talking about voice recognition and I have to say when Alexa first came out, you know, I've been in this industry for too long, probably, that when they say, oh, you know, you can ask her all these questions, you're going to answer them like, you know, it's voice recognition. How good is it really going to be? It's really, really good. Um, I know in general, you know, kids, young kids, sometimes she has trouble understanding. Uh, but in general, the, the uh, ability of the microphones to pick up someone, even with a lot of background noise, is uncanny. Uh, and also, she will respond to the speech output of a communication device. Now, I've had some mixed results with that. Sometimes we have to fiddle with the voice because just the acoustics of the room make it a challenge. But in general, you can use your communication device to talk to her. But as far as the calling features go, you can call any number in the US, Canada, or Mexico. So you can say, Alexa, call 512-522-1705. She will call that number. You can say, Alexa, call Papa John's Pizza, and she'll give you choices, and you can call Papa John's Pizza. Uh, you can say, give me the number for improvability, and she may or may not do that, depending on where you're located. Um, so I think people don't even know that that feature is out there. You can call devices in your home. So if you have one in the bedroom, one in the living room, you can use it like a intercom. You can also do drop-in. So for devices that have video on them, you can drop in and actually see the person that is in the other room. Oops. Okay, so I, I have a video showing how you can use that, but what we've actually set up a couple of people now where, um, so the person with ALS, 
it's using a communication device and their caregiver, we've talked about different options, but I've had two cases now where the best solution was having it where the person with ALS could call them on their phone through the uh, Alexa app and do video chat and vice versa. So let's say the husband has ALS, the wife is at the grocery and she says, hey, yo, is there anything you need? She can video chat. And depending on the person's ability to speak, you know, it might be that by seeing them, she can understand what the husband's saying, or he can use his communication device. So we set up a couple people that way, and um, that's been a really successful uh, implementation of uh, the Amazon Alexa. There's a million skills out there, so I'm just going to highlight this one called Ask My Buddy, where um, you can actually set up um, pre-made things. Uh, for, I, I would not depend on this for 911, you know, for true emergencies, but you can have it where it will um, call people and send texts to them uh, for certain things. So it's, it's kind of like an automation for uh, sending texts and voicemails, voice messages. I know I've gone to a couple clients that, you know, maybe their grandkids got them the Amazon Echo for Christmas, and they didn't even realize that they already had a smart thermostat and within less than 10 minutes, I was able to hook them up where they could use Alexa to set the thermostat. So if you, you may already have some of these things out there that you can take advantage of. And what I have noticed just, I would say in the last like six months, a year-ish, the Alexa app has gotten a lot of functionality in it where you can do a lot of automation and some fancier things just with the app. Um, I mean, I, I can't even give examples because there's so many things, uh, but I'll, I'll give one example because I didn't even know this existed until a client asked for it. So I had a client that listened to NPR every day. And so I just started fiddling around and you can actually schedule it and have NPR come on at 4 p.m. every afternoon for an hour. And you can do all of that through the Alexa app. I didn't even know you could do that, but she asked and I said, well, let me see. Let's see what we can figure out. So I'm just going, again, I'm just going to touch these and we can talk, take questions, more specific questions. But um, if you wanted to add some video cameras, so maybe you just have a bunch of dots around the house, you want to have some video cameras. Uh, this Wise camera is super cheap, less than 30 bucks uh, for the indoor ones. They just came out with outdoor ones. And you uh, can see the video. Uh, so to see the video on Alexa, you would need the video Alexas. So say you have uh, a dot in the living room, but you have a video one in the bedroom, you could add a WISE camera in the living room so that you could uh, see the person. You can do that with the WISE camera app as well, but if you don't wanna have your phone with you all the time, you could um, add some video capabilities. The Fire TV Cube, I have to tell you, the first time I set this up, I didn't think I had done it because it was so simple to do. <laughs> I don't know how it's doing it. it it's really crazy. So um, if you're wanting to control your TV, this would be a really good first step. There are some systems that it's not going to work for, but if you just have kind of a run-of-the-mill television, run-of-the-mill cable system, um, chances are it will work. And if it does work for your system, I'm saying five minutes, but it doesn't even take five minutes to set up. Uh, kind of a cool thing that it does is when you uh, so the box lives close to your TV because it's actually sending the infrared signals to your TV. Um, when you say Alexa, she mutes your TV, which is kind of cool. Uh, you can see some videos. So if you have a ring doorbell, you can say Alexa, show me the doorbell, the front door, and you'll see the video for your doorbell on your television. So there, there's some really cool things you can do with it. For light switches, I think people put off dealing with their light switches because they think they have to wire in their switches, which that's the preferred method of doing it. Um, but I get it if you don't want to put in your, uh, if you don't want to switch out your switches, there is this device which is literally a box that goes over your light switch that you can then operate. And this is a Zigbee device, so if you got one of the Alexas that had the Zigbee hub in it, you would not need any other um, equipment to operate this. Uh, and there, this is two screws. So if you're not afraid to unscrew a screw and screw a screw, they're very simple to set up.
and I believe they're about 30 bucks a pop. So they're about the same price as the wired in light switches. They do take two double A's. So at some point, I mean, I have a, no, a couple of these in my house. I would say the batteries probably last around a year, sometimes longer, just depending on how much you use them. There's some locks that don't require another hub. And I'm sure most of y'all are familiar with the Ring doorbell. Ring has other cameras uh, and Ring and Amazon work well together because Amazon actually bought Ring. So they have a little bit more of an integration. And like I said, thermostats, most, a lot of homes now even come with the smart thermostat. You may even not know it because some of the ones that are smart, they may not look like they're smart, but they actually have a way to be smart. So uh, a lot of people you know, want to be able to uh, control their thermostat. So something just to keep in mind, especially when we're talking about ALS, you know, we have to, whether it's a need now or it, it may never be a need, but we do want to kind of keep in the back of our mind, if you're going to invest any money in things, that it would be something that would be useful for you. Um, so we've kind of already talked about in general, the general concept is um, these smart speakers will respond to the output of a communication device. Sometimes there's some tweaking we need to do to make it work, but in general, uh, that will work. That's not really my preferred option. I mean, in a pinch, it works, uh, but you are going through the air, and if you're not close to the speaker, she may not understand you, and you may have to say it a bunch of times, and you know, so it's a good solution as a quick, if you already have this equipment, uh, but there are some more robust solutions where your message won't get lost in translation. In general, uh, right now, all AAC devices are Windows 10 computers. So if you're going to be investing in things, you want something that could eventually be run off of a Windows computer. Uh, so just keep, a, keep, in mind, keep that in mind. Um, what I've run into is I have specifically chosen not to install certain things because they only have app interfaces, not computer interfaces, which is kind of a beef I have with the whole home automation system, but I won't get on that soapbox. Um, if you have some things, uh, some home automation stuff, you may want to take a look at this uh, resource, the home remote. It's basically an, uh, it's a Windows program that lets you log into all of your smart things and control them. And if you're using a communication device, you would be able to operate them. Uh, video calling, well, I'm sure we've all become a lot more familiar with video chatting in the last couple months. Um, one system that I like is called Whereby. So it's just whereby.com. The thing I like about it is that it is super simple for the other side. So I can set up my account and I create a room and then I get a link and the person on the other end, they literally just have to go to that link and boom, you're in the video call. So if you're dealing with maybe elderly family members that are having trouble with Zoom and these other things, you may wanna give Whereby a try because for the person on the other end who maybe isn't super tech savvy, it's really easy. So for all the things we've talked about, you know, when you talk about home automation in this consumer-based world, you really, you need to have a good Wi-Fi signal. Um, you may need to purchase repeaters to make sure that the Wi-Fi signal hits the whole house. Um, I would say maximize what you already have. I'm running into a lot of clients where we have been asked to do an environmental control evaluation. They already have a ring doorbell. They already have some things. So obviously, if you already have it, I, I'm going to take advantage of that so we don't have to buy it again. The accounts and the passwords, I mean, this is just kind of life in the 21st century, uh, the passwords and the usernames do get very overwhelming. So I just kind of have to preface that when we're setting up systems, because we, for most of our environmental control systems, we're probably doing, you know, five or six accounts and they all have to have passwords. So it, it can get a little overwhelming. So if you're going to be purchasing this stuff on your own, really think what is the most important thing to me? So your most important thing might be TV control. So focus on that. And the great thing about this is where the consumer-based equipment really shines is you can add things as you go. You don't have to do it all at once. If you don't have Wi-Fi, which there are areas of this world that Wi-Fi is not a thing, um, or even it may be that cable internet is not a thing. Um, there are some ways, and I can go into more details if you want, but there are ways to do everything I just said 
except for video um, without needing the internet. So you can turn on and off your lights, do locks and uh, TV control, and you do not have to have internet. And then, uh, so just to kind of wrap up so that we can get into some questions I'm sure y'all have. Uh, we are based in Austin and Houston, but we will travel. Um, we work with TWC, the VA, independent living programs, and um, we will work with private entities uh, if we want. And we can go ahead and take some questions. I'm going to put our contact, contact information here while we take some questions. All right, we've got a question from Diana. How, we, how may we use your services if we don't live in the Austin area? So um, I would say just get in contact with me because um, depending on where you live, I, I've been around the block and I know a lot of people in different areas. Depending on what you're looking for, I probably know someone in the area that could help you or we have worked with some clients remotely. Um, it just depends on what you're looking for, but um, feel free to just get in touch with me and then we can um, figure out where to go from there, whether we do it remotely or if we travel to where you are or if we connect you with someone local. Thank you. If you have any questions at this time, please feel free to put them in the chat box or um, if it's easier for you to communicate uh, by talking, please feel free to unmute your microphone and ask your question. We're going to wait a few minutes to make sure everyone has time to answer their, ask their questions and we can get those in for you. We attend um, a number of ALS clinics. Um, so if you happen to go to the clinics that either me or Jimmy attend, uh, you know, we're happy to answer questions as they come up. Because it's my full-time job to stay on top of this and I will be the first to tell you, no one can know everything that's out there. So a lot of the things I showed you are things that we figured out from clients asking us. I've got a couple questions and comments here. Apple has really, this is from Lynn, Apple has really addressed accessibility issues. Is everything you use PC Windows based? Um, it doesn't have to be. It's just that um, for people who are gonna use a communication device, right now there is no eye gaze option for Apple. So, um, if someone's going to be using an AAC device, that's going to be a Windows computer. Um, now, saying that, we have plenty of people that we have set up where they can use voice control on their phone or iPad. Um, so we're familiar with both sides, but um, if with, with ALS, not knowing where the future is going to, you, you never know where the future is going to go. I, that's why I specifically mentioned Windows because all the communication devices as of today are Windows based. Thank you. Uh, I have a comment from Dutch who says, thank you, Antoinette. This is very helpful and has provided me hope about enhancing my potential independence in the future. Like I said, you know, I've been saying this for 20 years. If you can think it's out there, I mean, I could give examples of, you know, I would say if you have a problem, let us know about it because chances are if we don't know how to do it now with, if you, I don't know if you all have ever heard of the term of the maker community, there's people out there that we can connect with to actually make a custom solution. I mean, the need for that is not that high, but like as, as an example, I had a client that did not have ALS. She had a conglomeration of disabilities where long story short, we ended up needing a Morse code keyboard. And if you Google that, that does not exist. I mean, it does exist in a certain form, but not the form that she needed. But I knew, I wish I had gone to engineering school 20 years ago. So maybe one day in my free time, I'll learn how to do these things. But I knew enough to know that that was not a very difficult technical need. So I'm on a couple different Facebook groups. And so I put out the call and I found a guy who made us a Morse code keyboard that fit her needs exactly. So this is the world we live in right now, which is really cool. That's amazing. I think that's all the questions we have. If you have any questions afterwards, um, oh, here's one real quick. Alberto asks how to answer a voice call on iPhone. So there's a couple options. Um, if you still have a, a clear voice, the 
I say the quickest way to do it is there's a, they have some Bluetooth headsets that have voice commands built into them. So um, I would, I, the one off top of my head, there's others, but the Plantronics Voyager Legend is one where when you get a call, it'll say, you know, call from blah, blah, blah. And then um, you say answer and it answers the phone. So that's the simplest solution. Um, there is an option um, with, there's voice control, <clears throat> which is different than Siri. So Siri is you say, you know, I don't, I don't wanna say it too loud because my phone might actually do it, but you say, hey Siri, call Joe. Of course, they're going to try and do it. Um, so you can use Siri is for voice commands, but then there's an accessibility feature called voice control. So if you Google voice control iPhone, you'll find some videos that show how you can actually operate your phone fully with your voice. And that's it's different than Siri. And then there's if you don't have a good voice, there's switch control, which is where you can if you're using a power wheelchair, uh, the power wheelchairs have this ability already in them through the joystick, you can actually operate your phone through your wheelchair joystick. I have a question from Robert and Robert, please tell me if I'm not reading this correctly. Do you have anyone in Corpus Christi you could recommend uh, for anyone you may have worked with? Um, so we, we don't have someone located in Corpus Christi, but you know, our Austin people go to Corpus Christi. So if, if you have a specific need, feel free to reach out to me and we'll figure out how to get you connected. All right. Well, let's see, here's another one from Lynn. Uh, iOS 11 has an option to answer incoming calls automatically. Access the setting for call audio routing and turn on auto answer. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, that's a great option. Just know that that means every phone call, it is gonna automatically answer. I have had some clients that set that up and maybe turn it on when they know maybe they're gonna take a nap or not take a nap, but like um, be laying down where maybe it's harder for them to access their phone when they're laying down. So they'll turn that feature on so that if the significant other or a kid calls, it will just automatically pick it up. I don't know that that's something I'd wanna have on all the time, but to each his own. All right, well, we will send this recording out afterwards to everyone um, who attended to the email address that you registered with. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Antoinette. We really appreciate you having here. I know this is a lot of valuable information for everybody. This was just wonderful. Um, and we'll send out um, any additional information uh, to you guys as well that would be helpful. I know Antoinette's given us a lot of great information today. I hope you'll all join us for our next presentation, Stress Less on Purpose, with our very own Tanya on May 21st. Um, thank you all again for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.